or center of science, rather, at extreme conditions from the University of Edinburgh. Please. Thank you very much, Yaroslav. Can everybody hear me? Well, it's a great honor to be here. I'd like to thank Bill David and Kenneth Shanklin for the opportunity to come here. This is my third time here, and uh, I have very fond memories, and I shall reflect on some of those memories as we go through the, through the talk. I'm from Edinburgh, and the uh, sun also shines in Edinburgh occasionally, and here we see this, the, the, where the old city meets the new building of the Extreme Conditions uh, Center. So this is, this is where my students and my postdocs are, are based, and I, this is where I can go and hide away from teaching and administration. So the aim of my presentation then is to give you a very brief introduction to high-pressure research. It's an enormous field. Yaroslav rightly says there was a whole school devoted to this. Um, I'm going to show you a little bit about some, some diff high-pressure diffraction techniques. I'm going to show you some how diffraction can be used to probe the structure under extreme and I'm going to highlight some of the interplay between experiment and, and theory. I've got some pictures up there. These are, these are some influ influential people in my scientific career. Dave Allen, who's now at uh, the Diamond Light Source, came over one day from physics with a, with a diamond anvil cell and, and, and switched me on to, to high pressure research. Bill David has been incredibly supportive, even though his face looks like he's been Fourier transformed there. Um, <laughs> The, o the only other picture I could find of him was him eating a pizza, which was even less, uh, less um, uh, flattering. Bill has been a, a great support and a great source of ideas. And my first Riche conference was in 2004, um, organized by Joel Bernstein. A an amazing meeting, which will stay with me for the rest of my life and really transform the direction of, of, of my research. So these are transformational uh, schools. So your, you, your lives may be transformed by the attendance this, for the, over the next 10 days. So a little bit about pressure. So this is the, this is the, uh, the, high, the, pressure the high pressure research scale. And really, I don't want to go into any detail other than to note that we have an enormous number of orders of magnitude, um, over f almost 40 mag orders of magnitude there, uh, with which to explore in, in, in parts, of the, parts of the universe. So why would we want to study materials at pressure? Well, actually, much of our universe is not at one atmosphere. Much of it is significantly more. And here we are the, in the Marianas Trench here. We've got a, 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 we've got a pressure of over 1,000 atmospheres. And even at those depths, uh, life can exist all the way down. There are bacteria and bugs living down here. If we go into the center of the Earth, we see higher pressures still. And we're about 3.5 million atmospheres at the center of the, of the Earth. If we want to do synthesis, gems and minerals, that's, obviously that's done in the, in the Earth, but we can also do that in the, in the lab, provided we know with a phase, phase diagram. This is a fascinating book. I thoroughly recommend that you, that you read this if you're interested in, in high pressure research. It's about the race to make synthetic diamond, and uh, it, it's, it's a very, very, well, very, very well written, very um, uh, accessible, accessible book. Um, you can make synthetic diamonds from all sorts of things. So you can take somebody's ashes, one of your loved ones, and turn them into a really nice-looking diamond, diamond ring. Um, the company which does this, Life Gem, just, just requests that you send ashes, not bodies. <laughs> and if you have a dog, you can turn your dog into Yogi the Ring. So that's a, an opportunity for you. Um, mapping and understanding phase transitions is clearly very important. This is water, a very, very rich um, um, phase behavior over a relatively small pressure range. And in the, <coughs> the food processing area, we have um, increasingly now a lot of food is being not pasteurized, but pascalized, using pressure to treat food. And a lot of this is the today's best dressing. Lot of seafood is wearing nothing at all. Is the is the uh, the, the caption here? And this is a, a high pressure treatment of of lobsters. And you, here you can see uh, the lobsters come out of the high pressure. And uh, you, never, never, you don't need to have all that mess with eating lobster now. You can just uh, easily remove it from its. Uh, from it. And that's it's important processes going on there. What's happening to the proteins and, and, uh, and fibers which are, uh, are being pressure treated? An cl area close to my own heart is explosives and propellants. And understanding those is something that uh, we want to be able to do. Uh, a lot of these operate at, at very high pressures and, and or temperatures. If you're a material scientist, you perhaps know about superconductors. And it, I think this is a fascinating uh, 
uh, observation. So the, the high, I think the record is 133K at, at, at one atmosphere for the critical temperature. If you turn that to 115 gigapascals, you raise it by over 30 Kelvin. So you really can alter the, the properties, structure and properties of materials significantly to, uh, to change properties. Um, pharmaceuticals, I know some of you are interested in pharmaceuticals, so this is about polymorphs and solvates. Pressure is an excellent way of accessing these. You can use it in polymorph solvate screening. And increasingly, people are interested in mechanochemical processes. The processes of tableting or milling become, generate pressures and shear forces. Um, I haven't got any pictures for this, but insight into intermolecular and into atomic interactions. If you're going to understand those, then pressure is a good way of testing those models. Similarly, the, the um, crystal structure prediction is an increasingly powerful tool. And again, can we validate those, those models? Can, they, can, the, can the theoreticians provide us with space to search? So a little bit about, then about, about techniques. And the, really, the, the, the work, the principle of this is the, is the elephant standing on the stiletto. Now, training elephants to stand on stiletto heels to generate pressure is very difficult. It's much easier to train PhD students to work with diamond anvil cells. So it's a very simple principle. You have a force. Uh, you have a very small uh, um, area here. We have a, 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 a gasket, which is a, a piece of metal with a hole drilled in it. We put a piece of ruby in there, which I'll talk about in a minute. We have our sample, which can be a single crystal or a, or a, or a powder. And this is the, this is, this is the way it, 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 uh, it, it, it works. The ruby is there to, to um, measure the pressure. So ruby has a fluorescence signature, uh, which is dependent upon pressure. And it's a very well-developed scale. And so we can identify what the pressure is using the, uh, the, the fluorescence of our, of our ruby. So here's a couple of examples of diamond anvil cells. So these are, these are the sort that we use. These are quite large diamond anvil di diamonds, but you can use much smaller ones. The size of this hole can be um, as, as little as 10 microns. If you want to get really, really, really very high pressures, we typically work about 300 microns up to about 100,000 atmospheres or, or so. Um, um, we have a tungsten gasket. Tungsten gasket not only performs the um, uh, uh, the chamber, right, so we can drill a hole in there, but it also acts as a beam stop for, 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 for x-rays. There's, there's our ruby chip, and we have here a, a pressure transmitting medium, and in the notes there's some, there's some things about the, the hydrostatic limits of the pressure transmitting medium. So what we're trying to do with this pressure transmitting medium is to make sure that the crystallites, or your, your crystal, is at the same pressure uh, throughout. There are no gradients within the, within the cell. And that's fine as long as your material is your your, li li your material is is liquid. So as long as your your methanol ethanol is below 9.8 gigapascals, then you you're in the in the hydrostatic limit. But you'll notice that some of these materials, so fluorine, which is another common uh, pressure transmitting medium, um, has a much lower freezing pressure. And so these things these things can be can be can be important. So how do we do diffraction? Well, we, it's very, very simple. We have our usually a synchrotron source because we need high intensity um, x-rays and usually quite short wavelength because of the absorption of our diamonds and our small sample size. And we collect on, a, on an image, image plate. Now, we generally we use quite a small beam. And so the risk of getting a, a, single, crystal, a single crystallite or several single crystallites and, and therefore a textured pattern can be reduced by rocking our diamond anvil cell through 5 to 10 degrees to improve the powder averaging. And what do we get out of that? Well, we get a, a, a powder diffraction pattern. Uh, there's a the nice looking one here. You'll notice it's, it's not completely perfect. It's got a shadow here from the, from the beam stop. It's also got a, a spot here, which is actually a diamond reflection. So the sing, we're going through a single crystal of diamond. So we may expect single crystals. Occasionally, you will also see spots of ruby on there. That's easily done, easily fixed. You can mask that um, and then integrate using programs such as FIT2D. This is what you get. You get this rather steep rising background. That's the Compton scattering from the diamonds, but that's relatively easily subtracted. And we can get our, our pattern out in the normal, normal way. Well, we are not working at the same sort of resolution as we've, we've seen for some of the other. Uh, this, this, the high resolution that we normally expect, we are rather limited in, in, res in resolution. And so we will suffer from overlapping peaks. We will suffer from um, um, uh, poorer, poorer resolution. Because diamond's transparent, you can use other 
electromagnetic radiation to look at it, so you can use infrared and Raman to examine things and look for phase transitions. If you want to heat your diamond your sample up, you can heat things up to 3,500 Kelvin um, and, uh, uh, and, at, and, and, and at pressure. So there are opportunities to really go to really, really extreme, extreme conditions. If you want to do neutron powder diffraction studies, then probably the most common uh, piece of equipment in use is this so-called Paris Edinburgh cell. And it's a, a, a large piece of, piece of kit. Um, for neutrons, uh, neutrons we remember, as, as uh, was said this morning, the flux of neutrons from sources is, is, much, is much lower, so you need larger volumes, typically perhaps 100 cubic millimeters or so. And so you need correspondingly larger, larger presses. And there are a couple of geometries that you can use. So you can have a standard flat type gasket, or more recently, we've been using these encapsulated gaskets, which allow better hydrostatic, hydrostaticity. Um, and with the appropriate um, anvils, you can go up to 20 gigapascals. That's, that's 200,000 atmospheres, and all the way up to about 1,500 Kelvin with appropriate, appropriate heating. So extreme, extreme conditions indeed. This is just a close-up of one of these, these, these uh, tungsten carbide anvils and the, and the gaskets. So we load our sample here. We put in a, because we have no optical access, we have to use diffraction to measure the um, uh, pressure. And so we measure the, the lattice constants of sodium chloride or lead or, or even aluminium and <coughs> using the, um, uh, the, 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 the neutron beam. That all, that all goes into this assembly here and then is put it sandwiched here. And our beam actually comes along in the plane of the board, and our scattered beam comes out towards you. Right? So we're only, we're only actually collecting at, at 90 degrees, which means immediately then we have rather limited um, uh, coverage, of, coverage of reciprocal space. So I want to now give you some, some examples to show what, what can be done with this. And I'm, my background is as a, as a chemist, and so there's inevitably a, sort of a chemical bias to these. Um, I do apologize for, for Laura, from the, for, from, uh, who, who was a, who's a geo, geo, geoscientist. Um, I haven't got any geo, geochemical ex examples, but if you want a geochemical example, talk to, talk, to, talk to Laura. So here we have a oxygen, which we all think of as a, a diatomic gas. But if you take it to, to high pressures, if you take it up to 11.4 gigapascals, what you get is a, is a, a system which is, contains the O8 unit. So there were two parallel publications came out of this. This was the Japanese group who, oops, who did it with, with powder diffraction um, and got the, obtained this O8, O8 structure. And it sort of in parallel with it within, a, within, I think a, within, a, within a month, I think, uh, Malcolm McMahon and his, and his group uh, obtained a single crystal, um, which, which, which also showed that this was the O8 o structure. And I think that's rather, rather neat because o, we always think of oxygen as being a, being a di diatomic um, and to get an O8 unit and to get something which turns, changes color to form, to form red, I think is a, is a nice example, one of my favorites. Um, another example, very recent example, is a collaboration between um, call my colleague, one of my colleagues in, at, at Edinburgh and the uh, ESRF. And I really, this is a nice one because you take silicon and hydrogen and you load them into a diamond anvil cell and you apply pressure and a bit of time and what you end up with is, is polymeric silicon hydride. So no heating. This is a simple reaction between silicon and hydrogen at this really rather large, large pressure. All, right, all done by, by powder diffraction. You can identify the hydrogen in there. You can identify the, 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 the new polymeric silane. And it all sort of fits together because there's, a, there's a nice, another parallel experiment where you can take silane molecules themselves, these are tetrahedral, molecular, take them up to high pressure, they dissociate, and they get, you get a morphization, and we can monitor, see that happening. So this is a, is a phase transition between here and here. Still got Bragg peaks. We're starting to lose the, 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 the structure there. We have an amorphous phase there. That's mirrored in the Raman spectrum here, where we've, got, we've lost, sort of lost our signal. And then we get this new, new polymeric phase here, where we have bridging, bridging hydrogens. And I think it's a very nice, very nice looking, looking structure there. And that just completes the, 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 the silane phase diagram there. So we can see it goes all the way up, up to these, this, this, this polymeric, uh, these polymeric phases. 
All right, another person who's influenced me is uh, Elena Boldyreva from Novosibirsk. She was a co-director of the, of the 2009 High Pressure School, and um, she's had a long interest in, in high pressures and pharmaceuticals, small organic, or small organic molecules. And so some of her early work then was, was to looking at the effects of, of this molecule, this is paracetamol or acetaminophen if you're from the United States. And what happens there is she, she's plotted the lattice, the lattice parameters of, uh, of, of the A, B, C and the, and the, and the beta angle and, and, the, and the volume. And what's interesting here is that both A and B decrease, as you might expect, as you're applying pressure, you expect things to, to, to contract. But the, the C axis actually starts to increase beyond about three gigapascals. And you, she explains this very neatly in terms of um, the changes in the hydrogen bonding and the changes in the layers structure of the, of the, of the paracetamol, paracetamol molecules. So it's just to a, just a, just a highlight that you don't always get um, um, a decrease of, of all of your lattice parameters. They can be highly anisotropic. This is a, this is a compound, a, a, a rather simple compound, dimethylurea. I've chosen this not because it's particularly it's not a particularly exciting molecule, but this, the, the, the powder diffraction studies that we, that we conducted are actually show some interesting uh, uh, concepts that I want to that I want to highlight. So this is this is the, this is a, a, a orthorhombic form, form one. Um, nothing particularly exciting about it. There was a a form two, which you ca can crystallize from phosphoric acid after six months. I know always be suspicious if, if somebody reports in a paper that it took six months and that you've got some odd looking solvent, right? We, were, we certainly weren't trying to use phosphoric acid as a solvent. We were trying to do some co crystallization. So this is a, an accidental um, one off and not, and not a reproducible result. Um, we found this form two in several batches from Sigma Aldrich, and we wrote to Sigma Aldrich and asked them whether they would tell us how they were processing this, how they were making this, and of course they, they declined to tell us. We did an extensive polymorph screen at ambient pressure to see whether we could, recover, we could, we could see this form two, um, and, we, and we really, we, we, really, we couldn't. We, we never saw it again, all right? So Joel Bernstein has written a, a, a very good article about disappearing polymorphs, um, and this is, this is potentially a, a, another example, example of it. So we decided to do powder diffraction. So this is we're starting with form one. This is a, it's a very, relatively simple, simple pattern. Notice that we're using quite short wavelengths, so the, the two theta values that you might be familiar with are all, everything's con contracted into much smaller um, uh, um, uh, region of two theta. B before we've got very much pressure at all, this is only about one and a half kilobar, we have a transformation, but it's a transformation to a new form, a new form three. And that carries on all the way up, and here it goes, and, the, and, and, we, and then we come down in pressure. And it sits there for a little bit, but after about 36 hours, it, it comes back to, the, to, the, to, to, form, to form one. All right, so we've seen a new form, but it's, it's not our form, our form two. Now this is where these image plate images are, are, are great because they tell you about texture. Somebody mentioned texture this morning, right? So this is our form three recovered, and you can see nice complete rings, right? A really rather nice looking looking powder there, um, good powder, good powder averaging. 36 hours later, though, we get we've, we've, it's clearly a different pattern. We know it's form one, but we have a textured, a very textured pattern. So as an exercise for the audience, if you're under 35. I want, I'd like somebody to suggest to me what's happened here. Why have we got this textured pattern? Yes. Uh, preferred orientation upon recrystallization. Absolutely. So it's, it's, it's preferred orientation, which is why it's spotty, and it's recrystallized somehow, and it's actually recrystallized from the from the from the solvent, All right? So from the sorry, from the pressure transmitting medium. All right. So a, a message here. Be careful of your pressure transmitting medium, right? This dimethylurea is very soluble in, in, in methanol, ethanol, and so what we end up with then is a, a solvent-mediated phase transition. So here's our form three. So it, it starts, to, starts to dissolve, it's less, less stable, and then we, it precipitates out as the more stable phase two, and it forms little, little crystallites in this way. So you can learn a lot then from looking at, you, at, these, at these images. What else can we do? So if we take a different, 
um, pressure transmitting medium. This is fluorinate. Um, this is a, a fluorinated uh, hydrocarbon, perfluorinated hydrocarbon. Dimethyluria is, is, is virtually insoluble in this. And we take form one, and this time we get a mixture of forms three and form two. So, we, so this is a mixed phase pattern, which we're able to, to deconvolute. Rather surprisingly, we go all the way up in pressure, and nothing, nothing happens. We, all we're getting is some broadening of our, of our peaks. And if we look at our uh, image plate, we see a very unhappy looking uh, uh, pattern here. A lot of broadening there, um, indicative of, of significant amount of, 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 of strain here. But if you, if you get some strain, well, one way of doing that is just to give it a little bit of energy, and so a bit of heating to, to 150, and we, we get this beautiful pattern. That, that was a, 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 a textbook pattern. And that turns out actually to be form four, all right, a, a, a new form. Um, there it is, it's significantly different from what we, what, we, what we had there. And you can see the difference in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the patterns there. If we then decompress this, so it's, we're still in, then in, in fluorinert, we, we again start to see a strained, rather un, un, unhappy looking, looking sample. It's still form four, but it's, but it's not looking particularly, particularly happy. So again, give it some energy, and we have a, 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 a transformation here. Rings, rings look much better. And what we find then is that um, we've, this was what we started with, for our form four. We've decompressed it. And then we've got form, form five after, after a little bit of, bit of heating, so a new, a new form. Um, and then over a period of time, it actually transforms to form one. And we've still got some form, form five in there. So a relatively simple molecule showing rich phase behavior but also very dependent upon the nature of the pressure transmitting medium, um, both, both depending on its freezing pressure, but also on, on the solubility of, of the material. And then we collaborated with a <coughs> Graham Day from the University of, of Cambridge, who's a crystal structure prediction uh, uh, genius. And he, uh, he managed to identify, uh, predict form four, form three, and form two have all been identified. Form one, rather interestingly, is sitting, sitting up here. And we, we haven't yet solved the structure of form five, so form, maybe form five is lurking out, out here. And so when we see these sorts of plots of we're plotting lattice energy against, against density, quite often we find that these outliers out here are, are quite potentially um, high pressure forms. So this is a, a, good, a good signal to start going using high pressure techniques to see whether you can find these forms. Okay, I'm going to change gear now a little bit and, and talk a little bit about one of my favorite areas, which is energetic materials. So energetic materials then are, are um, polite word, it's a polite word for, for explosives, propellants, gas generators, and pyrotechnics. And what these things generally do is if you give them some sort of initiation, a shock or a spark, they will give off lots of, lots of gas. And I, and I really delighted to be here to be actually to talk about this because in 2004 this man Tom Brill stood up and gave a talk about, in, about polymorphism in energetic materials and that was a, an, an eye-opener to me and prompted me to go down this this avenue of, of exploration and um, it's been it's been very 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 profitable and, and very satisfying so acknowledge his, uh, his, his uh, inspiration there. What are they used for? Well all sorts of things Entertainment, signaling, mining, munitions, etc. I'll just show you some examples here. So here's the Edinburgh tattoo, military tattoo, where we have fireworks every night. It's the Scottish mountain. This is where if the bad guys want to shoot you out of the sky, then you have to drop these flares to deflect the missiles. If you want to shield your, your, your vehicle, you can deploy smoke. You can generate oxygen from these candles, which are simple oxygen candles. And you can save lives in the using, using airbags, and we'll come back to airbags a little later. Um, if you, uh, uh, those of you who remember the moon landings, will remember images such as this, where the, the, the lunar module um, was landed on the moon, the Ariane rocket. If you want to eject out of, a, out, of a, out of a plane which is in trouble, then you can do that very, 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 very nicely. You've got to get the timing very, very, very rapid, rapid combustion, rapid uh, series of events, it's the Harrier jump jet off the coast of uh, East Anglia, and here you can see the, 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 the man parachuting. Unfortunately, he lands on top of his plane. 
But you see the very, the very rapid burn, and the, and the important thing is that you've got to blow this thing on first, otherwise you go through the, through the, through the, through the canopy. So, it's very important. A little bit on, on so explosives, we can split them into primary explosives, these are things that are detonators, they give you a, sh a short, sharp shock, uh, and then you get a secondary explosives, they require more of an effort to get them to, to, to uh, detonate. But one of the important things is that you generate very high shock pressures within the material, and very high sh speeds of the shock wave moving through the, through the material. So these generally are extreme conditions when they're, when they're operating. And so if we look at um, important properties of, of energetic materials, these are just some of the things that are, that are important, particularly sensitivity to initiation, impact, friction, spark. Uh, density is important because it, it, it dictates the power of your, of, your, of your material. And of course, material scientists or crystallographers will realize that all of these properties depend on crystal structure. And I think that's a, a, an issue which is perhaps not always appreciated within the, the energetics community, um, and, uh, and therefore there is, there is mileage here to, 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 to help them. Um, why do we want to study these at, at high pressure? Well, I've already mentioned that these uh, that they, they operate in extreme conditions, um, and so we need to understand what sort of structures they have. We want things like equations of state to be able to, to understand their properties. I think this is particularly important, the validation of computational models, how well can we, can we um, reproduce um, experimental high pressure structures of, of, of these sorts of materials. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about Sony Mazai, which used to be used in, in airbags, um, no longer actually used as a chemical reaction there. Very rapid reaction because you've got to inflate this airbag before you go through the, through the window and screen. Um, and I just wanted to show you this little video. It's my, my favourite favorite videos. Some of you may have, some of you may have seen this before. Um, and we can explain that by looking at the, at, at the structure. 
And I should mention, of course, if you look at the volume versus pressure, you can obtain equations of state from, from, from these measurements. Um, and this, this gives you a measure of the compressibility. Um, and there are various ways of fitting these, these points, there are various types of different equations of state. Again, a, a, a whole, uh, whole uh, lecture course on it in, in its own right on, on that. But it, it allows you to compare the various compressibilities of materials. Um, very important in, in energetic materials, also very important in, in min, min, mineralogy. So if we're now looking at uh, both pressure and temperature, so this is an experiment where we've raised the steady laser, squeezing it up, and we've also slowly raising the temperature at the same time, and as we get to critical temperature, 393 Kelvin, we get this transformation to this new form, this, this new gamma form of, of sodium azide. We've got a very nice fit to the, to the, to the powder pattern, that solve the, solve the structure, refine the structure. And it turns out actually that we've turned sodium azide into the cesium azide, the cesium azide structure. Right? That's quite a common sort of uh, uh, effect, right? We, we, we actually, lighter elements become, uh, well, develop higher coordination numbers, they become more like their, their heavier group members. We see a big decrease in volume, big structural rearrangement, and that explains this kinetic barrier, which is why we needed the temperature to do that. We see sodium acting like cesium. And on the way down, we get, when we recover it, we actually we have to go all the way down to 2.63 gigapascals before we actually uh, start to see um, recovery of the, of the alpha form. But it's a very strained system, all right? And here we are, this is what we started off with, and this is what we've we ended up with, so very broad peaks. Still a significant amount of strain, presumably because of all this, this, this enormous rearrangement which is, which is required. So let's look at cesium azide. Cesium azide, you think, would be quite boring, but it certainly isn't because there's a phase transition at quite low pressure, and then there's another one here, and then there's another one here. Um, really very, very rich. We're able to solve the structure of the, of this, of this, of this, of the uh, form 3. Um, and if you then do this at the diamond light source, then you can get uh, X-ray powder detection patterns from, from this. So here we see form three, here we see form four. Um, but it's not as simple as that because here we do see radiation damage. It keeps coming, re rearing its head, doesn't it? Radiation damage. And this is this is actually the visual image of, of this. I mean, you can see this this sort of cross effect here. Well, that's because we were line, we were using the beam, the X-ray beam, to line up the sample. And so we were actually scanning backwards and forwards, x and y. Um, we were calling it a shot to the middle. We had a shot through here, a shot through there. And you can see the, see the radiation damage um, as, 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 we've, as we've done that. So that's, a, again, a take-home message. Look carefully at what you've, what you've got, um, even with these high-pressure high pressure samples. Um, what that means, of course, is that the data are not, uh, are, are, have, have, have issues with them. Right, so this is our form 3, which we saw from the neutron, where we have no, no radiation damage. Um, and we have clear misfits here, we really cannot fit these peaks at all. Um, we certainly can identify metallic cesium, um, and there's possibly some other identified products. And the exciting bit here actually is, is that there are there polynitrogen ions actually lurking in this thing. So actually we, we're combining pressure, with, which is an extreme in its own right, but we've also got an extreme condition, which is the beam the I-15 beam. So don't forget that your, your, your beam is also a source of extreme conditions. My final example is, is this molecule, Cl20, hexanitra, hexa, azo, iso, vertice. That's why you can see why it's abbreviated. The chemists amongst you will realize why this is the most powerful explosive in current use, because it's a very strained molecule. Right? We have a series of five-membered rings, six-membered rings. We also have NN bonds, we have nitro groups, and we have a source of, of oxidizable fuel here. So that's why it's a, a good explosive. Um, it has a rather rich polymorphism and ambient pressure, and again, it's probably not surprising because actually you have a lot of conformational flexibility with these nitro groups. So here are just some possible conformations. These are isolated molecule calculations just to see how these nitro groups and you can almost imagine these nitro groups as well, it's like, it's like semi -sem semaphore, these, these, these nitro groups can move all over the place. And um, so, this is the phase diagram, and what we are interested in is this gamma to zeta transition here, which occurs um, at about 0.7 GPA, all right, it's been known for some time, but not, not really, not really under, 
was understood, but certainly there's no, no structure known for it. Um, and so this was an experiment at the diamond light source. We're using fluorinate here as our, as our pressure, pressure medium. And we're able to see new peaks growing in this, 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 these pressures. Um, that's, the, that's, the paint, that's, the, that's the pattern, incredibly complicated, but a very nice powder. So this is clearly some sort of, um, uh, uh, this is a very, very, very good powder. Um, but we couldn't solve it. We couldn't index the pattern, or at least not unambiguously. Um, and so we turned to single crystal work, and we're able to index single crystals. So there's a couple of single crystals in a diamond animal cells. This gives us our, our, a single crystal. But we still can't solve it because um, we don't have, we, because of the limitations of the diamond animal cell, we don't have enough uh, access to reciprocal space. Um, and so we, we, we've got shading by the, by the diamond animal cell, uh, the steel body of the diamond animal cell, and so we can't solve the, the data using single crystal data alone. So what we've used then is the, is the global optimization methods, which Radovan will talk about in more detail. It's a fantastic prop program, FOX. We found it incredibly, incredibly useful. Where what we're able to do is to, is to we, we know the space group, we know the units, we know the unit cell dimensions, we know what the molecule looks like, it's got some confirmation and flexibility in there, which we can allow it to, to explore. And from, from this, we actually solved it from the from the powder, the powder diffraction data, and then went back and refined the, the X-ray data as well. So it's, it's this, the message I want to get across is that you use should be using a range of different uh, complementary techniques in order to, 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 to get the answer that you need. And there it is, this, 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 is, this is the confirmation of the zeta form. So this is, this is gamma, this is zeta, and what, all that's happened is we've this, this one of these arms is swung up um, to get this, uh, this one. And it actually turns out to be one of the confirmations which was calculated from the, um, the isolated molecule calculations. So they it all fits together really rather, rather nicely. Uh, it doesn't all go well, so this is a bad day at, at ISIS. So this is about 100 milligrams of the, the compound you've just seen, CL20, on pressurization. And for some reason, the, 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 uh, the, the uh, anvils came together rather rapidly. Um, the, 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 gas, the gasket failed, and so they drove together. We had a, we had a, a shock event which led to a detonation, and we can see the damage that it, that it causes, causes here. To the, to the gasket, and it, it, it blew out a couple of the little lights uh, illuminating the, 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 the cell. I should emphasize that no postdocs or postgraduate students were injured in this, uh, in this experiment. <laughs> so, just to summarize, I think extreme conditions does do offer exciting possibilities new chemistry, new physics, new structures, new materials. I think they're getting more and more accessible, the pressure techniques are becoming more accessible. <laughs> Use complementary techniques to solve the structures, exploit the synergy between experiment and theory, and do talk, if you have want, if you have want to do a, a, an experiment of high pressure diffraction, talk to these beamline scientists. They really are experts, they're very, very helpful, and will give you a, will save you a lot of pain and, and effort and actually guide your guide your research. So do do that. And finally, I'd just like to thank a few people, particularly David Miller, um, who's one of my post PhD students and, and postdocs work very hard on, on, on this work. Bill Marshall, a long-standing collaboration. Without him, we really wouldn't be able to do half of this work. He's been an absolute, uh, absolute star and, uh, and deserves the, the credit and recognition for it. Other, other members of the, the teams are both at, uh, at, at Diamond and ISIS and, uh, and Black Home, and then these funding bodies for, for their funding. And I'd like finally to thank you all for your, for your attention. Thank you.
So, so what I've shown you that most of the time there is, is using synchrotron sources. You can do pan diffraction with cloud-based equipment. And I think what perhaps is interesting is the use of rotating anodes. And I know Yaroslav I think is, 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 is looking at uh, setting up something with a rotating anode and a, and a, and a diamond animal cell to, to do to do power diffraction measurements. The, the issue is resolution and also the, the length of Data, data collection. But for some of these simple, for rather simple systems, um, you would at least get an idea as to what you would, what you would be doing. So what you would need then would be some, some diamond, animal, diamond animal cells, and you can either buy those commercially, there are various suppliers that will, that will supply those, or there are designs out there which are good workshops that you can get to, you can, you can, you can get people to make for you. Um, if you make them yourself, I would say they're probably about uh, 3,000 euros. If you buy them, they're like so, um, the uh, if you already have an image plate set up, um, then uh, you can you're, 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 you're well set up. You need you need to be able to drill holes in your in your in your gasket. So a, we use spark rovers to do that. Um, I think they they are they are getting cheaper. I believe a, a five thousand euro something like that. Um, uh, so. They are, it, it, is, it is not cheap, but it's not incredibly expensive, and the, the efforts can be very, very useful. I think that's all the questions from the audience. Yeah. Uh, Martin Risco from Australia. Um, the pressure transmitting media, yes. um, at 3500 Kelvin, how well does that survive? I think, I think for those sorts of experiments, you know, they, they, they don't bother with the pressure transmitting medium. Um, if you're, if you're uh, there, you're already quite, quite often you're in, you're in the liquid state anyway. So, you, so the, the material itself may well be, you may well be crystallizing from the liquid, in which case that acts as the, as the, as the pressure counter. From there. Yeah, Martin, Carlos from Brazil, first South Africa, Yemen. What about the, the simple preparation for X ray diffraction? I, I do absorption experiments in high pressure in Brazil. We are starting to put in work. And uh, what about in, in X ray diffraction? I, I suppose that it's easier to prepare the sample inside the diamond field cell. We have no problems with the thick of the, the sample. How, how is it? Is? Well, most of your absorption is by the diamonds, um, unless, unless you're working with. Um, heavy, heavy elements. So there are some cesium samples, lead samples. They, 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 you will see a certain amount of attenuation from the from, from, from the sample. The key thing I think is to get is to have um, very finely ground samples because typically on the synchrotrons you're using small beams. And okay, you can get around it some of it with rocking, but if you really want very good powder averaging, then, then 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 try to get very, very finely ground, uh, ground material, if, if your sample will, will survive that. Yes? Yeah, thank you. Uh, first, first question and maybe a comment. The form alpha and beta of, of the sodium nitride. Azo, yeah. Right? The, the, the patterns are very similar. They're different, but they're very similar. Mm -hmm. Do you, have, you didn't show us the two crystal structures of those. I suspect there's a lot of similarity in the crystal structures. Yeah, they are. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. And then the comment, if I may, is that Mr. Chairman, is that okay? I just the, your 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 little story about the cell exploding reminded me of I don't know how many people are familiar with the name Walter McCrum, who was of course a hero to to, to many of us in the polymorphism field. And during the, he would, during the Second World War, he was a, a postdoc at, at Cornell, which had a, at Cornell University, which had a, a major effort at synthesizing new explosive materials. And the only way of characterizing things in those days was by doing melting points. And of course, the people who were the synthetic organic chemists who were preparing these things didn't want to do any melting points because they were afraid of the same kind of accidents Shows. So Walter McCrone, who was a premier
chemical microscopists agreed to, to do melting points for a price. In 1942 and 1943, he was charging a dollar a shot, and he finished being a post. <laughs> By the time World War II ended, he was a very rich man. <laughs> <laughs> was that? So, so that sometimes that's quite really quite useful because what you immediately rapidly encounter non hydrostatic conditions um, that can have negative effects because it can actually broaden your broaden your peaks. But actually, what you're what you're creating is, is pressure gradients, really quite substantial pressure gradients across that that that's, that's uh, across the in, in the chamber, and that can actually help. Uh, phase transitions to, 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 to take place, and indeed there are some phase transitions which will only take place um, if you have the, those non-hydrostatic conditions. A, a very good example is ammonium nitrate. There is some spectroscopic evidence to show that ammonium nitrate, if you take it to 3 GPA, with, with no gasket and no pressure transmitting medium, just right, just put it between two diamonds, you will get a you can get a new a new, a new phase. Now we've never dared to do that simply because if you have these two diamonds grinding against each other, you're almost guaranteed to, to break break one or both of them, and at you know, a thousand euros each, that's uh, it's an expensive experiment. But but it, it is certainly uh, um, something of of, of of interest. I can confirm that many ionic compounds actually so they may serve themselves pressure transmitting medium. So if you are interested in compressing them. Uh, they work pretty well, even better than with the salt. And they are quite often, there are some compounds which are pretty reactive, like metal hydrides, for example. We altered them without pressure transmitting medium. Now, I, sh I should have added to the start of the talk that I'm, I'm probably not the best person to give this. Yaroslav really should have been giving this, uh, this talk on, on high pressure and the diffraction, since he's a, he, a really is a true expert. <laughs> uh, so, the last question. Thank you for lecture. My name is Tintin from Peking University and I have a very simple question for you. Um, usually we use rhenium and uh, steels as the gasket, but why do you use TICR as the gasket? Oh, in the neutron, the neutron diffraction experiment. Thank you for, ra thank you for raising that, 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 that uh, um, uh, question. So we're using titanium zirconium alloy, alloy in the neutron experiments, only for the neutron experiments, because as uh, Laurent said this morning, you can, if you have different elements, have different scattering lengths. So this titanium zirconium one-to-one -one alloy has a, um, a zero um, a zero attenuation, or low, very low attenuation. So you don't see any Bragg peaks. You, you do see some absorption, but, but, but it's mainly uh, you, you lose the um, Bragg peaks uh, because they've got opposite scattering scattering lengths. Um, for the X for the X-ray experiments, we, we simply we use tungsten because it's probably I think cheaper than rhenium or, or platinum, and unless unless we are going to be working with very um, corrosive materials or at very high temperatures, then, uh, then uh, tungsten works work, works very well. Thank you. So let's yeah. you want to comment I, the one, final one, world. one more historical comment. Go, go back to the H N I W slide. I, I, Colin didn't point it out, but there was a, an interesting. Uh, no, one back there. No, no, uh, no the, the reference to this. Uh, no, where, uh, the Stanley Block was. There it is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the audience may not be aware of it, but Stanley Block was a fourth author on this paper, and his colleague, uh, Pierre Marini, actually prepared the first diamond anvil cell that was used in the, in the late 60s. And the pressure was applied by just a thumb screw. And I actually was, was uh, had, the, had the good luck and fortune to hear them describe making the monoclinic form of benzene in that cell, which was published in Science in 1969. So that, that was the first high pressure bound in the cell at the National Bureau of Standards in the United States. Great discussion. So let's take this speaker again.